gonna talk about micro and macro evolution of languages in the micro side we're gonna talk about Finnish dialects and then she's gonna present the macro side which is Uralic language speciation of Uralic languages and all this work is done in a pro project called Petlan where the biologists are shown in green and the geographist assistant of ours is in yellow and she, he is responsible of the maps here and he is also guiding the GIS methods. And the others are linguists from different um, areas. I'm kind of supervising the research and there he yeah, represents the part of the project that is actually doing something. <laughs> so. So our microevolution, microevolutionary studies are based on Finnish dialect atlas. And that was collected in 1920s. And it started when Lauri Kettunen bought a motorcycle and started to go around Finland. That is Finland. So he uh, traveled around Finland and visited all the parishes or municipalities that we were having at the time, which were over 500. And he collected <coughs> dialectal traits there. So interviewing people and he tried to collect uh, over 200 dialectal traits from the municipalities and each of the traits uh, was able to have 2 to 16 variants. So and the outcome is published in uh, as a big atlas. So the trait number 2 is the map number 2. And this was initially digitized by uh, Canadian researchers, by Sela Empledon and Eric Wheeler, uh, together with Institute of the Languages of Finland, or something like that, and our pro project. We were adding the coordinates and the background map and, and everything. Uh, some things that I will present you soon. So, so um, what are the evolutionary units here? Uh, we are considering the parishes, for example, for is here, that is considered as one individual. And so we are having 525 individuals. Uh, each individual has genome and the, uh, you can um, study the loci from the genome. And we are considering that the dialectal traits are as loci. So we are having 200 loci. Each loci diploid organisms having two alleles and there can be lots of alleles in the population and we are having two to 16 variants in a that's a individual which is the municipality can have and was there something else no <laughs> clear <laughs> so we are having frequency data of dialects that is very cool data really and uh, as then we wanted to put it in a structure analysis, which is used in population genetics. And that is used for finding whether the data of butterflies or, or plants is showing population structure. All right. Uh, and for our data, the structure said that, yeah, you have populations, but it, the machine wasn't so sure whether, how many there were. It was something between six and 14. And we are now presenting here some results of the age population, and that's because most of the earlier linguistical uh, studies assume that we have seven to eight populations or dialects. All right, so here is, is, the, is the result so that the darker area here, is, here are showing the central areas of the dialects and uh, a bit more pale areas surrounding, of the municipalities surrounding the surrounding the central areas are showing uh, the, the areas, the municipalities where the dialectal traits are not so clear. All right, and when comparing these to the earlier uh, studies, we were, we were very happy. You can see that the, the dialectal map is not that different. So this, this shows that our, our results were not completely from outer space. Anyway, we also run uh, analysis called K-means cluster analysis that also creates populations. And here 
And this disanalysis is quite widely used in linguistics. And here is a map when we made eight populations with the Kenis cluster. And again, you can see that they are quite similar. However, we, we would underline that this structure analysis is quite nice because Kenis cluster uh, assumes that the borders between the dialects are very sharp. But uh, structure is allowing a great gradual change in the, from the population to another. Uh, yeah, and then these, these, the municipalities that are not really belonging to any certain dialects, uh, they could be also shown with Sannon Wiener diversity index. So now we make this Sannon Wiener diversity index for the municipalities. And the dark area here are some of the areas that have lots of uh, linguistical variation. And they are naturally occurring at the border area of the, of the populations, dialectal populations. All right, and then uh, we run AMOVA for this frequency data to study the, the variance components, variance components of the dialect data. And um, we found a bit surprising results. So from the dialectal variation among the population, among the population, only the smaller part was related to within population variation. And it was quite much bigger portion that was related to between population variation. And this is, this contradicts, for example, the fairy day results from Monday, where the, the between population dif differences or the variance related to between populations is, was, was smaller. And, but this has to do with the way that the data is collected, that the data is not a completely random sample of all the possible linguistical traits, but Lauri Kettunen knew exactly what he was looking for. He was looking for traits or loci that would maximize the differences between the populations. From Amno, AMOVA, you can also get the FST values or phi PT values, and that's uh, that means like how different are the populations actually. And we wanted to uh, study the linguistic distances between the, of the dialect populations in relation to geographic distances of them and also in relation to cultural distances and environmental distances. So uh, we measured the geographical distances and collected information from statistics from the late 19th century and, 20, and early 20th century about statistics about mm, density of people, a number of households with all the, all the heating system, birth rates, immigration and so forth. And we also collected environmental data like temperature, rainfall, rainy days, uh, snow depth and so forth. And um, as you have heard, you can use, you can use um, study the distance matrices in relation to other distance matrices, like geographical distance matrices, with mantle test or partial mantle test. But this multiple regression on distance matrices is allowing you to put much more distance matrices in the same analysis. And to put very long and weird story short, uh, these are the factors that remained in the model. So these are the environmental factors and cultural factors that has something to do with the dialect uh, matrix. And now if you, that we wanted to, now when putting all these to the same model, we will get a model that was uh, significant and explained almost 90% of the linguistical uh, the variation of the, in the linguistical distance, distances. And uh, the geographic variation explains about 10%. <laughs> <laughs> uh, <laughs> and uh, cultural. <laughs> no, 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 no
And the cultural distance is explained actually a bit more, and environmental distance is, well, you can see the proportion, and then they are presented when they are shown together. Um, we did the same kind of analysis also for the linguistic distances of the municipalities. And uh, here we ended up to a little bit different kind of model, a bit different kind of factors uh, stayed in the model after removing the, the unnecessary ones. And again, the model was significant, but it explained only uh, less than half of the variation. And the geographic distance uh, played a role here, similar sized role as the cultural and environmental distances together. And from to summing from these and some hundred other analyses that we have been doing, uh, it's, it seems that the geographic, geographical distance plays a role here as there are cultural factors as was assumed, but also the environmental uh, factors dividing the populations or specific to populations or, or locations uh, have something to do with the linguistic variation. Okay, so now I go on from here, and we go then to the macroevolution part of the story. So here you can see the world map with like different colors about the language groups which have been studied with these computational methods. And we are studying now these Uralic languages which are high up here, and these are the 17 languages what we used in our analysis. So Finland is here, it's the most important thing. So what we did was that we collected these basic vocabulary lists. So there are these uh, commonly known lists like Swadesh lists and this uh, more newer list called Leipzig Jakarta list. And as these lists overlap quite a lot, so we wanted to check like how many different meanings there are in these lists in total. And there are 226. But then as there's always discussion about what's the effect of borrowings, how do they affect the results? So we wanted, and as there's also a discussion that these Swadesh lists and Leipzig Jakarta lists are not necessarily universal and don't apply to each language group equally well. We wanted to make a, like a core vocabulary list for the Uralic languages. So from these 226 meanings, we took away the um, meanings uh, where there was attested borrowings and we ended up with a list with 100 items we, and I call it Euro 100 list. And the tree looks like this. Here we had also reconstru reconstructed the proto uralic and we rooted the tree with that. So first here are the Samoyedic languages, which diverge first from the tree. And these Samoyedic languages are the Nenets and Selkup here far behind the Uralic mountains. And then here's the rest part of the tree, and as you can see from the short branch lengths and the, uh, that these values are quite far from one, which it gives the highest support for the uh, branching, that there may have happened and probably have happened many divergences in a very short time, and we cannot say that the branching order would be exactly this one. But something a bit more complicated has happened there at that time. And then, uh, when there's always also a discussion about these networks. So we did those two to see whether it's affected to the way the tree looks like or the way the groupings are formed. And as you can see with these colored clusters, the groupings are pretty much the same, as you can see. But then, when we wanted to know, as there is the discussion about the borrowings, that what happens when you, as this is now the data, both are from the Euro 100 data where sh there shouldn't be borrowings, that what happens when you do a network where there are words with more, which are more prone to borrowings. So again, here are not, and here are a lot. Here is a lot. So you, again, you can see that the groupings are pretty much or very much the same. And then the difference is just that there is more reticulation in here, as especially like in these 
Finnic languages and these Sami languages, there has been a lot of contact with each other, which you cannot see here, as the borrowings are not included in there. So basically, what, as this doesn't uh, falsify our tree structure, but it more the tree structure shows the skeleton, what has happened there, but this then brings flesh to the bones that what's the extra stuff, what has been going on. So the next thing what we wanted to find out is why do these language divergences occur? So we took this speciation hypothesis from biology and there are these two models, red queen, where the speciation is thought that it's the biotic interactions such as compet competition which cause the speciations. And the other model is called Chester, according to which is the abiotic factor, such as changes in temperature which cause the uh, speciations. And so here again, we did the timing analysis to the Eura 100 data, and the tree looks like pretty much the same. So again, we have here first the Samoyedic languages, and then there's a phase where very many divergences occur. Short branch lengths, small values in here, suggesting that that time has been messy, like in ling lang linguistic wise. And what you can see also from this picture is the color scale here, which represents the temperature change in the speaker area of the Uralic speak. Yeah, Uralic speaker, speaker area. So the most orange part uh, says that the temperature was 3.5 Celsius degrees higher than it's today. And here you can see that the temperature is declining. So you can see that the uh, first divergence occurred at the time of the temperature peak. And that these several divergences which happened after that coincide with the time when the temperature started clue, uh, cooling. So if, is there any logic behind this? Well, when the temperature rises, also the primary production rises, which then makes it possible that the, uh, there, in the same area there can be larger population size until the carrying capacity is reached. Well, then after that, the people need to start dispersing and with the human dispersal also the languages disperse. And pretty much the same thing happens when the uh, climate starts cool cooling as um, but then the carrying capacity is reached more quickly because then the primary production level is already is go it's going down. So again, then carrying capacity is reached, human dispersal and language divergences, uh, language dispersal that happens then also. But added to these uh, temperature related factors, there's also of course many cultural re related factors like suggested by the Corchester model, no, that red queen one. Like for example in here, this timing when Finnish diverge from Karelia and Webs coincides very well with the time when the Sla Slavic tribes came to the area and uh, Karelian and Webs became under the uh, Eastern sphere of influence and Orthodox church and Finnish uh, was under, became under the influence of Swede, Sweden and the Catholic Church. So, to sum these parts up, so there are these, um, some cultural changes which cause these language, or seem to cause or coincide these, with these language divergences. So, you could think that there are many cases when the Red, red Queen model is acting. But, what we want to emphasize is that I think, or we think that it's important to think that there, behind these cultural changes, there can be actually also some changes in climate, which then trigger the changes further in cultural and then in languages. So thank you for listening and, <laughs> and the, and the Hanhen Kaulat. <laughs>